1998, uh, when Art City was first piloted, the situation of West Broadway was like pretty dismal. Okay. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of crime, a lot of violence, a lot of like youth that were unsupervised and, and uh, underserved and, um, and a lot of poverty. Um, so that's still the case in West Broadway, but it's certainly not uh, at the same level that, that it was. Yeah, it's, it's, it's better. It's better, yeah. And, um, you know, that's a complex reality as well, but we won't, we won't, uh, we won't, we don't need to get into that. Um, but um, Wanda Koop, who is a very celebrated artist based in Winnipeg, was living on Spence Street, just around the corner from where Art City is today. And um, she herself had, 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 was given access to free art programs as a child. Uh, she struggled a lot. She was a, a child of an immigrant family and she had um, an undiagnosed learning disability and various other things going on. Um, but uh, art was where she found her ability to express herself. And so having benefited from that herself so much and ha ha having gone on to become um, a, a notable artist uh, and, just a, and, and just a community minded person, she started to do little art workshops herself by the community center, um, the Broadway Neighborhood Center. Okay. And, uh, and so kids were responding, they were becoming engaged, they were doing some neighborhood beautification projects. And, and um, anyway, based on that work, she was invited to speak at a panel at U of W. And there is where um, she met uh, a man who was a philanthropist and he spoke to her after and he said, what, what is your, what's your vision for what you're doing? Like, where would you like to see this go? And she said, well, I, I envision a storefront art center uh, that's free and accessible to anyone to come in and, and make art and, uh, and experience community um, through making art. Uh, and so one thing led to another, a kind of group of community members mobilized around this idea and uh, June of 98, Art City opened. So, I obviously don't expect you to put all that in your newsletter, but that's sort of the context of how uh, Art City's in inception. Um, since then, you know, we've developed best practices and, and we've um, become a lot more uh, organized, but without becoming like institutionalized, if that makes sense. Like it's very yeah. much a community organization. Part of, well, obviously, so our sort of main mission is to provide a space that is safe and that is sustainable day after day, year after year, where community members and kids in particular know that they can come and it'll always be there and uh, where they can have the tools and the encouragement and the support to uh, make art. So the end game- Seven days a week? Uh, it's five days a week. Oh, actually, Typically, it's six days a week because we do have an Indigenous art program that runs on Saturdays, and then we're closed on Sunday. Okay. Um, all of our programs are free. All of our programs are um, drop-in with, like, one exception. Um, so the idea is that people can just come and go as they please. They don't need to register. They don't need to have money. They don't need to sign up. It's just come as you are. Um, and the goal is not to uh, make all participants artists with a capital A. Uh, the idea is that by having regular access to art programs, you develop the ability to think creatively. And an art project, I always use an analogy of like an art project as a model for being resilient in the world because you have to, you first have to envision something and then you have to take action. And then as you're, working toward the, 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 the goal that you want to achieve, you encounter problems, you, you, you realize that the materials won't do what you want them to do or whatever. So you have to, you have to find, you have to develop problem solving skills and you have to learn how to um, improvise and, and also to adjust your expectations. And then once you've, once you've gotten to the point where you're um, happy with the artwork that you've made, which anybody who's made art can tell you that it's very difficult to become happy with the 
project that you've made. But you then you then you start to practice that and you develop mastery over that. And and and, and I think that that's a those are transferable skills no matter what you go on to do in life. And um, and and so we we at Art City we feel that everyone has the capacity to create and should be given the opportunity, if not encouraged, to do so. And um, so that's kind of like the the philosophy, if you will, about Art City. Um, but like any community organization, it's all about building relationships. It's all about um, authentic relationships. Um, we're not we're not there to help participants, although we do end up providing resources and, 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 and directing them to resources and a number of different other ways that, that, that we are able to um, help them address other issues that are going on in their life. But really the idea is just to make art together and to have this collaborative environment um, that's open to anyone. We celebrate all different kinds of art mediums. It's mostly visual art uh, as opposed to like performing arts. Yeah. But we, we do occasionally dip a toe in, in those as well. Um, and the way that we develop programming is, well, we have an artistic director and uh, he works with our studio programs manager, who's Toby, who you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they come up with ideas. But then also we meet monthly with our youth council, which is uh, an open group. Anybody can attend who happens to be there that day. But we treat it like a... a formal like almost like a board meeting we have an agenda and and take minutes and and we just ask the kids for ideas we evaluate our programs that we've had like what, what do they like what don't they like and then uh especially in the last 10 years we're more and more just literally taking their ideas and putting them right on the programming calendar hmm. and it creates like a super uh high level of buy-in from them because they know that they can share their ideas anytime and that we're actually going to listen and implement them and it makes the programming really relevant to them. So that's one way that we do it. But we also, part of our model since the beginning has been inviting guest artists in to lead workshops. So um, our employees are all practicing artists uh, and they facilitate workshops all the time, whether there's a guest artist or not. But when we do have a guest artist, then it's, it's almost like a, um, I don't know if you're familiar with like artist residencies, but the, there's, they're all over the world. They're, they're usually around a month long. Ours are a week long, but um, typically it would be for an artist to go and like work on a certain project. They might do research or they might like be interested in the environment where the residency is, is hosted. In our case, it's a residency that's all about community collaboration. So those guest artists are bringing workshops that are based on their actual practices. Um, and then, and then we, we kind of help them reformat them for a community context, especially with kids. And so this is great for the participants because they're having, they're, they're, they're getting exposure to practicing artists, some of whom are like pretty high profile, others of whom may not even identify as an artist, but they have a cultural practice or something to share. We, we bring in a lot of like knowledge keepers and uh, indigenous uh, elders and newcomer uh, artists or, or cultural you know, producers uh, to lead workshops. So there's a really diverse range of, of artists and mediums and, and cultural content that's coming in through our guest artist series. What we're doing right now is um, we we've, we've retrofitted the front door at Art City with this, um, this device that we made. It has a little plexiglass window that you can communicate to people outside through and then like a cylindrical drum that's open on one side and closed on the other. And it's on like a, it's on like a, yeah, yeah. so and we've, we basically have just taken the language and format of like what restaurants are doing right now. And we developed a menu of 20 different art experiences that you can take home. And they're really cool. They're like, they're not just the bag of art supplies. Like there's like booklets in each one that kind of like gives you different ideas for how you can use the materials, whether it's on your own or collaboratively with the people that you're like stuck at home with. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we have a couple of virtual programs going, but for most of our participants, uh, they're either, they either don't have access or they're just not, they're not uh, into doing programming that way. So this is kind of a way that we can keep connecting with the community and keep, you know, putting opportunities for art out into the community when we can't do in-person programming. And the, the response has been huge. We've gotten tons of positive feedback and more people are coming to pick up 
these uh, these curbside kits than than arguably would be attending workshops. So what's so for an example, what's in a curbside kit? Um, so there's one that's called uh, Build a Furry Friend, which is like we take a bunch of old stuffed animals that you know we get from like thrift stores and stuff. We cut them into pieces. And then we put sewing materials in there along with like fabric and other like accoutrement that you could use to make your own custom uh, stuffed animal. Yeah. <laughs> there are instructions? Yeah, yeah. There's instructions and, and you know, explanations on how to sew and, and, and not poke yourself. And, and also like, you know, thinking about what kind of what kind of character you want to build or whatever. So there's ones that are like pretty, pretty simple and accessible like that. There's, there's kits that are like just drawing materials and then tons of drawing games that you can play um and especially like collaborative drawing games which we do a lot at art city and um so like each game has a different sort of um uh approach to making drawings and it's and, and it, everything that everything and this goes for not just the curbside kits but all the programs that we design are meant to be uh, process based it's more about the process of the art making than it is about the product that you get at the end um, so, uh, it, it, in contrast to something like what we call cookie cutter crafts, where like there's there's a there's a kit of art supplies, you're supposed to put them together like so, and everybody gets the same thing at the end, you know, and there's like virtually no self expression involved. Yeah. So we kind of try to do the opposite, where it's like it doesn't really matter what you get at the end. What matters is that you like have fun doing it, that you engage with the activity or with the people that you're making art with, and uh, and hopefully you end up with something at the end that's like fun or or, or cool or, or expresses your emotions or whatever. But the journey, uh, is, the journey is, is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of different curbside kits and, and uh, I won't do it justice by trying to summarize, but uh, we just refreshed the menu with, a, with, with new, a whole new 20 items. And then part of the process of doing that, we engaged some guest artists to design their own mm -hmm curbside kits. So one, one local artist, Jordan Stranger, whose work you've for sure seen around, he's like, he's like a, he's like a cross between Norville Morso and Keith Herring. He just does like amazing graphic indigenous artwork. Okay. And um, so he created a kit called How I Started Painting, where he talks about like what got him into paint, how he like developed his skills. Um, what's his, sorry, what's his name? Jordan Stranger. He, he goes by Totem Dudum on Instagram, I'll, I'll spell it, I'll spell it in the chat here. Okay. Um, check him out, he's really cool. He's, um, it's interesting too, because his his father was one of the first staff members at Art City. Wayne Stranger is his name, and he's a very accomplished sculptor now. How, how um, many staff members are there in total? Right now we have 22. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's a lot more than I thought. Like full time? No, there's five full time. The rest are part time. A lot of them are, are, you know, like I said, they're artists, so they supplement their income with work at Art City, or some of them are students. Or um, are they all paid? Oh yeah. So oh, where, yeah. Did, where where does like I, I think I've heard I, I remember last time that you were getting treatment, or maybe a couple of times ago, you were involved with the uh, you know political. I don't want to say necessarily um, what are those people that lobbying <laughs> you're it seemed like you were almost lobbying for our city so is that something that needs to be done like every year and make sure that you're getting some funding or where does funding come from yeah that's a great question before I answer it I'll just mention that paying artists um, a meaningful wage is fundamental to art city's model mm -hmm. so the idea is that art that artists are actually really important change agents in our community and they're highly undervalued <laughs> in that role. Right. And so part of Wanda's vision for Art City from the beginning was to offer meaningful employment for artists and the guest artists that come are also paid and they're paid according to, uh, there's an artist, a, a national artist union called CARFAC um, and they, they establish like fee schedules for what artists should be paid for different kinds of work is it, is it like based on how, you know, prestigious you are as an artist, you get paid more or is it just like a standard? Generally, no, actually, they just kind of do a standard for everyone. Okay. Um, and, and this isn't, they, they don't set prices for artworks, but right. 
they they establish fees for artists when they go for example if they go and do an artist talk at a gallery you know something like that there's an established kind of like fee um and i guess it's up to the artist if they want to charge more than that or whatever but that's yeah, just yeah, kind yeah. of like the that's kind of like the standardized the fee guide we have that for dentistry too oh okay yeah, yeah. there you go um so anyway i just wanted to mention that because it is like we're in service of the children and youth of the community were also in service of artists. Okay. Um, and yeah, so to answer your question about funding, we have operational funding from the city of Winnipeg. Um, that was the one that we were, like you said, sort of lobbying about. It was because the, the city had proposed 10% cuts to all community grants, right? which they, which they, uh, which they went ahead and did. Oh, they um, did. Yeah, they did. Um, so it fortunately wasn't, it didn't devastate us, but um, it was more of a symbolic, um, it was more of a symbolic jab <laughs> than yeah. anything else. Cause you know, they were bumping up the police budget. They were bumping up all these other things at roads. They're like potholes really more important than, than community services. I don't know. Yeah. Right. They suck. They suck. But like, <laughs> yeah. anyway, I could go on about that. I won't. We get operational funding from the city, um, from the province, uh, mostly through the Urban Arts Program, Arts Centers Program, and then from the United Way. Oh. Um, and then aside from those three operational funders, um, we get funding from project grants. So project grants are like, you know, it might be Winnipeg Art, Arts Council, or sorry, it might be Canada, Canada Council for the Arts or Manitoba Arts Council, it might be there's a, a, a oodles of foundations that give project grants. So I apply for more than 30, I think at last count, project grants a year. Okay. And, um, and we're, we're, you know, we do pretty well with that. We also do our own fundraising uh, that largely takes the form of one annual fundraising party and it's a big bash and- Yeah, you know, I've been there. Okay, yeah. So yeah. we try to make that party like, so awesome that you would want to come even if you didn't know or care about art city yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you <laughs> and we do really well with that fundraiser um so that's that's and then we have a really dedicated amazing donor base um and we we i would i think the last time i calculated i think about maybe almost a third of our revenue came from our fundraising and donor base really and that's pretty remarkable because there's own like the 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 contributions from the donors are uh, not huge, and I don't say that um, pejoratively, but yeah. we get lots of small contributions. Like yeah. people who don't have a lot of money are sending checks. Um, you know, there's probably half a dozen that are in the five hundred to a thousand dollar range, and otherwise it's all like less than that. But it adds up, and yeah, uh, for sure, it, it's amazing. Um, so. so yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, this is, I don't know. I don't know if it's a good question or not, but like, is there anything that like, say someone were to, um, give you a, like more, is there something that you guys have like on a wish list that you're like, ah, if someone were to give us X amount of dollars, it'd be so nice to be able to buy this thing or set that thing up, you know, like, is there, yeah. is there something that you guys think about? Yeah, so there are a number of items on our wish list, ranging from uh, relatively attainable to uh, large dreams. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will mention just before I get to that, something that I would be remiss to leave out uh, is, is, you know, you were surprised by how many artists we have not employed. Part of the reason for that is that what happens at Art City and West Broadway is a very small part of what what everything that we do. So we have an uh, extensive outreach program. Oh, really? uh, and the format for that is that we partner with other community groups and organizations that are already working uh, with usually youth in their community, but they don't have art programming. And rather than starting from scratch to develop that, if they've identified a need, they can come to us and essentially contract us. Um, and we're nonprofit, so you know we're not we're not like upcharging, we're, we're, yeah. we're able to offer it for very accessible uh, amounts of money. And we also help organizations get grants in order to do that. Um, and we, but, but uh, we have a specific city funded grant that pays for five sites. 
Um, but we're, you, you, again, in like normal times, we're um, providing outreach weekly workshops at 12 to 16 different locations every week. And so most of those are with most of those, most of those are with children. They're like after school programs. Um, but we now have one with adults with disabilities and uh, two or three with older adults as well. 